This morning uh, we are looking at the title of the lesson is Building a Theology of the Glory of God. And uh, for starters, this is a very, uh, for lack of a better word, challenging, daunting task. Uh, We're talking about uh, systematically arriving at a doctrine of the glory of God. And the glory of God, as you've seen over the last several weeks through the Bible, is multifaceted and is used in many different ways and contexts and has a depth and complexity to it that makes it, in a sense, impossible to to truly systematize. I I read an author and he was saying it's like wading out into the ocean and trying to, uh, with just where you are, understand the ocean and say you know how deep it is and you know how far it is and you know how much volume it is and what its chemical makeup is. Um, However, it is good that we labor to come up with uh, systematics as long as we stick to the word of God. So if you would grab your handout, I want to just review it briefly with you and then we'll go into the first point. It's building a theology of God because it's an ongoing process. Um, you know, that, that's a, when you say building, running, anything with ing on the end, it, it It gives that sense of continuing. So this is something that we ought to be continuing. We're aiming towards a theology. We're not saying we have arrived at a systematic theology of the glory of God because of how vast it is. And the primary question we're asking, if you look on your handout, is how do we build a systematic theology of the glory of God? Right now we're transitioning. Um in our Glory of God series from biblical theology to systematic theology. And I want to show you a pyramid I want to draw on the board in a minute, but just let's go through just the main points so you know where we're headed with this lesson. And it's going to be three parts, so I'll be here the next two weeks as well, continuing on this. But first, let's review the biblical theology that we've been through to get our mind back into those uh, areas that we've covered so that we can kind of look at the landscape as a whole. And then from there, let's work towards developing a summary definition of the multiple biblical meanings of God's glory. So we want to labor insofar as we can see from Scripture we're able to, to compile all the the meanings and senses and definitions we've gained of the glory of God, and then uh, try to summarize it. So that's what the second point we'll be attempting to do. And the third point is understanding, this will be future lesson, uh, probably next week, understanding how God's glory uh, relates to God himself. So once you get a, a, a statement and a definition that is laboring to uh, get a summary of all these different meanings, now we have to understand what this is communicating to us about God himself. Is it one attribute? Is it all of his attributes? Is it his presence? Is it his... Uh, shining radiant light uh, upon others. What is the glory of God and how does it relate to him? So that's where a lot of systematic theology is done in that category when, we, when you're trying to relate things to one another. Um, and also previous with the definition. And then the fourth point, we're going to be considering expressions of God's glory and important truths. So we've seen the God's glory displayed 
like at the tabernacle or the temple or at Mount Sinai with Moses uh, or the burning bush and then on into the New Testament with Jesus Christ and the signs and his birth and his uh, transfiguration, his second coming which is prophesied, his death and resurrection and then on into the, the epistles. But uh, when we say considering expressions of God's glory in important truths, we're considering God's glory and how it relates to or informs other theology. Um, we say that God is transcendent and God is imminent. How does God's glory uh, accomplishing both of those simultaneously. How is it relating to those? How is God uh, self-sufficient and full and yet receives glory? Uh, how is it that God is unique and alone God and he will God give his glory to another and yet he shares his glory with creatures? And then looking at how God is particular in the way he reveals his glory in creation and in redemptive history with a certain people, and yet he's also simultaneously universal in certain ways. So we, we, when we're considering the expressions of God's glory in these important truths, that's what we're going to be looking at, and that's also coming. And then the confession part is just a reminder of the doctrine of God, a couple important paragraphs on the doctrine of God, and then of the last judgment, because um, even if you read there, 32.2, God's purpose for appointing this day, that's the day of judgment, is to manifest the glory of his mercy and eternal salvation and of his justice. So God reveals his glory in his glory being the goal of all things. And that confession a uh, paragraph was given to help us remind us of that too because we're trying to get a big picture. So we're looking at the doctrine of God kind of at the beginning and the foundation of everything, but we're also looking at the consummation of things and the outworking of his glory. And then there's some questions related to today's lessons. I'll update more information on this handout and uh, uh, send it out again with different or updated questions. And... There's some memory verses there and a primary text, um, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. It's bringing together uh, multiple things about the glory of God. That's why it is a primary text. And then the catechism questions is to help remind of things uh, related to the doctrine of God and our relation to him as image bearers. Okay. Any questions this, thus far? I know that I've just briefly mentioned the handout and what we're attempting to begin now. All right. I wanted to show you this, paragraph, uh, this pyramid real quick. I, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but when this is the the theological pyramid, so to speak, it's it's a, a helpful diagram when you're thinking about building a theology from the Bible uh, on whatever the Bible is revealing. And what you start with is the proper canon. Can you imagine trying to build what we ought to believe and what we ought to do from the wrong source, like including the Apocrypha? How now we have, we've cut 
out or undercut all this other work because we began with the wrong foundation. So you begin with a canon, and then hermeneutics proper, some, it has a general term, and just means the, the science and art of interpretation, but proper or narrow definition of it is the, the study of the principles of interpretation. It's kind of like the rules of the game. Somebody can tell you the rules of chess, that doesn't make you a good chess player, but at least you know the principles that you're supposed to play with. That's what this is, the right principles for interpreting scripture. Thank you. So we get that from the Bible because the Bible interprets itself. And then you do exegesis. So when you have the right principles of interpretation, you go to specific text or specific groups of text and you do a grammatical, historical interpretation of that in its original context with its original audience and author as well as a theological interpretation because uh, God is not as also the author of it. So God is revealing something of himself in his Bible. And we need to consider the theology that he's revealing even in our exegesis. Biblical theology, though, is looking at the work of our exegesis across the canon. So as you work through a book of the Bible and then you progress and Revelation's progressive, right? Well, you work from Genesis. Let's say we're studying justification by faith. Well, Genesis reveals things about justification by faith. So we go do exegesis in Genesis on all those texts that might deal with that. But that, that is going to progressively grow and develop in the canon. So as we walk and walk down the canon into the future Revelation, we're going to find out what it meant here and what it meant here in Romans and what it meant here. Now we have kind of walked the, the, the path of the Bible in a biblical fashion. And once we've got that, then we labor to take a step back and look at all of the work that has been done in our theology with working through it exegesis step by step through the Bible along with the story of the Bible, redemptive history. And now we want to systematize it. And that means like, topically, what does the Bible reveal as a whole in its various aspects and perspectives on this doctrine, looking at all this biblical theology we've done? And can we make summary statements about the theology on that matter? that we, we can say the whole Bible teaches this. And then once you know your systematics on a theology, you practice it. And I know that that can seem uh, like daunting, but this is the proper way. And of course, we practice right after we're born again. It's not like we had to go get everything to know how to practice because the Spirit illuminates us. But we do need to constantly have our practical theology built on good interpretation. And this is a, 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 a pyramid to help remind of, of priority. And why I brought that up is this is where we are. So where we've been in the lessons is really right here. We've been in this region. When Noel and Pastor Michael and Jerome and everybody's been teaching, they've been teaching you biblical theology. If you think about it, we went through the Old Testament. We went through the Synoptic Gospels. We went through Acts and then Paul. And of course, the brothers were having to do exegesis at home. And they probably were sharing some of the exegesis in the middle of their biblical theology and then their exegesis is built on their hermeneutics, you know. But what you're getting taught was the, the biblical theology. Now we have transitioned into this. Any questions about that? Is that helpful? Okay. That's good news. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's go to the, the uh, review and... I try to consider how much time this could take and should take. I'm really planning on just jet flyby for time's sake. 
because you have those handouts, you have those lessons recorded, um, and I know not everybody here has been through every lesson and has got to participate in them all, but the, this class is not to repeat that, it's just to remind you and review. So let's just look at each one of these in, as, uh, in a couple minutes. And the glory of God in the Old Testament, if you remember, the vocabulary was kabod, kabod, and it meant heaviness or weightiness. It was a common Hebrew word used and got translated into the word glory. And we see God's glory revealed in various ways in the Old Testament. We see it with Moses at Mount Sinai. We see it in the tabernacle where the Shekinah glory we see it in the children of Israel being delivered from Egypt. We see it with the ark, and that's back to the tabernacle, where the mercy, God is seated on the mercy seat. And what is a predominant theme in the Old Testament was God's present with his people. Um, so anything anybody wants to add there that, that they remember? about that in the synoptics we moved um, and focused in on Jesus Christ and God's glory was revealed in Greek in the word doxa which really largely took on the meaning of the Cabo because in the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, they would use the word doxa in place of the Hebrew kabod or kabod. And <clears throat> even though doxa had its meaning among Greek users, because uh, the authors that translated the Hebrew into Greek are translating the kabod into doxa, that doxa took on a biblical sense. So it does carry with it that heaviness and that weightiness that, that the kabod originally meant. Uh, but it, it has a variety of meanings. It can mean the condition of being bright, a state of being magnificent or greatness, which is kind of like kabod. Honor, uh, you can be honoring somebody, giving uh, them glory. And it can be ref a reference to a transcendent being deserving of of honor God um, you, had, you had just um, asked you, you had just asked um, can you remember anything from the Old Testament and I had to think about it for, for a second but something that has stuck, stuck out and I don't know if you want to speak to it or you know, maybe just an affirmation if you have seen the same thing you know as you're now talking about the synoptic gospels and the Lord Jesus Christ and him being, you know, the radiance of the glory of God. Um, in the Old Testament, Noel was um, showing us how um, glory was associated with the voice of the Lord or um, the word of the Lord. You know, the, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. And, you know, it, it's interesting that the the Son, you know, God the Son, Jesus Christ, he's also referred to as the Word. You know, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, um, and then through, through Paul and through um, the, the other New Testament, the epistles, um, the, the message, um, the message of the gospel is the message of the, the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So it's a it's a glorious message. Jesus Christ is the Word, um, who is the, the glory and radiance of the Father. And in the Old Testament, um, his word or his voice, his speech is associated with power and glory. So it's just, you're talking about biblical theology and a biblical theology of the glory of God and how, you know, the Bible's teaching on glory expands and progresses. Uh, it's just really interesting to see those connections between yeah. glory and the voice, message, word of the Lord. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm glad that you answered. Uh, and I, uh, anybody else that wants to share more too, that's why I asked. And amen. 
yeah, we can see that uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of many things uh, and is the word of God. Um, anybody else that think of anything they want to add with the Old Testament? All right. The next uh, was the the New Testament with the synoptics, and there's that word doxa that we were looking at in its various uses. We saw it in the birth of Christ. So if you'll remember that God's glory was revealed at the birth of Christ, that the shepherds were greatly afraid when they came into a manifestation of God's glory. Um, and it says that God's glory shone around them. Uh, we remember that the angel of the Lord and the heavenly host uh, said that they were bringing good news or good tidings. And they said, glory to God in the highest. Uh, so there's this revelation of God's glory in the Messiah coming and it being good news for men, which we know is the gospel. And Simeon uh, described Christ and the salvation that comes by him as a light unto the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. And then we see the incarnation itself as a whole, how God reveals his glory by condescending and humbling himself, becoming a man. Uh, God of very God, one person in two distinct natures. Um, and that is a marvel and we can see and remember uh, as the Old Testament prophesied that the Lord would come and send his, his chosen one here we see it, it is the Son of God and then we see God's glory revealed in the transfiguration uh, where Jesus clothes and appearance changed before Peter, James and John and then we see Moses and Elijah who also appear in, in a form of glory. And then we hear the Father speaking from the cloud, the glorious cloud. And he said, this is my son. And we were reminded that um, all these transfiguration events or all this going on at the transfiguration is to point towards him being the hope of the believer, him being who we need to trust, hear him. And then also God's glory is going to be revealed in the second coming of Christ. He says that he's going to come in the glory of his father and he's going to sit on the throne of his glory and his works will reveal the glory of God. In John, we saw that God's glory was revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. So we took a look there with all the emphasis in John on who is this chosen one. When we say he is the son of God, what do we mean? Um, God's glory is revealed in Jesus Christ and he is the express image of his person because he is the eternally begotten Son of God. And we see that, that the glory of God is Trinitarian and that God the Father glorifies the Son, the Son, the Father, the Father, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Father, the Spirit, the Son. So uh, we need to remember as we were looking at our biblical theology that the glory of God is Trinitarian. And then also God's glory it was revealed to us in all these signs that John lined up. Um, he turned water into wine. He healed the nobleman's son. He heals the lame man at the pool and he feeds 5,000. He walks on water, heals the blind man from birth, raises Lazarus from the dead. And the purpose of these signs was that uh, those who hear might believe. So you can see God, who is this God? 
He is the God who performs miracles, supernatural works through his son that you sinners, us sinners, might be saved. And that in and of itself is the glory of God. He's the initiator, the savior, the sovereign. He's the only good one. In Acts, we saw um, the same verbs and, or that same word in its uh, different forms, doxa or doxazo, glory and glorify. Uh, Stephen mentioning the God of glory and then uh, doxazo, Jesus glorified by God in the healing of the lame beggar. The people glorify God for the lame beggar being healed so we can see that uh, that God's glory being manifest in healing somebody actually causes people to glorify him. So when we're putting our systematics together, we need to consider in what way is, should we include this reciprocation? God's glory is, is revealed in the Holy Spirit's powerful witness of Christ. Um, God's glory is in the Holy Spirit's worldwide witness. So we see this powerful witness, but we also see the scope going worldwide. Um, God's glory is jealously guarded. So Ananias and Sapphira seek their own glory and are struck dead. Herod refuses to give God the glory and he's... Uh, what was it? Eaten by worms. That was Acts. And we saw in Acts too with the Holy Spirit that Jesus has ascended and he sent the Spirit and through the apostles the glory of God is manifest in them through the works of the apostles and the preaching of all the disciples. In Paul's epistles, um, we were reminded of the Old Testament roots of Paul's understanding of glory. Um, and we saw that Paul had this uh, unique or extraordinary experience of, of his own salvation when he encountered with Jesus in the glory of God. And that actually had a, a remember Pastor Michael teaching on this, uh, a large impact in, in his communication of the gospel. And Paul is a minister and preacher of the gospel. So the glory of God is revealed in the gospel. So we need to remember that, um, and as we were looking at Paul's epistles, that the focus was on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, that the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ as the wisdom of God, the glory of Christ, it's rich with glory and it's central to Paul's theology. And in that gospel, Paul would remind of the two states of Christ, his humiliation and his exaltation, if you will remember that. His humiliation was his time of being in the likeness of sinful flesh and humbling himself and suffering even to the point of death. And his exaltation beginning at his resurrection was him coming forth out of the grave with uh, the first fruits of a glorified body, uh, which is our uh, forerunner. He is the first fruits of our own resurrection. And we see that particularly Jesus Christ is the glory image of God. So we need to behold him as we consider the glory of God in Paul and then knowing how Paul is looking back over the Old Testament, seeing Christ come and him soon to come again. Uh, Paul is already doing a lot of systematics for us by uh, telling us that it centers on the gospel and that Jesus Christ particularly is who we need to look at to see the, the glory of God in, in his image. <clears throat>
And also, um, we know that God's glory will conform us into that image of Christ. So as he is the express image of God, God through him is bringing us into conformity to that same image. And then in the general epistles, we saw that with James, God's glory is in a living and working faith. So um, we remember that Jesus is the Lord of glory. And I remember James uh, warning against false faith. Um, God is glorified in us and by us and will accomplish his work through us by a working faith. And we must remember that our Lord is impartial. And Peter is, God's glory is revealed in joyful suffering and submission and service. See, now we're getting into the church. So as we're looking at these different aspects of God's glory in our biblical theology, uh, we can see how it's got this pattern of redemptive history, of promise and typology with Israel and pointing forward to a presence of God dwelling with his people and the voice of God and then here comes the New Testament and everything that God prophesied about the Messiah comes to pass and now we're seeing the church God's glory revealed through the church particularly in joyful suffering submission and service and God's glory is going to be revealed above his rivals above false teachers, it overcomes. And in Jude, uh, we must contend earnestly for the faith. So, in going on in Hebrews, I'm just reminding of these things. We saw in Hebrews a focus on Jesus Christ's priesthood and particularly, God has spoken through his son. He is the radiance of the father's glory and the exact imprint of the father. He's been crowned with glory and honor. And he's the apostle and our high priest. Uh, so there's, an, again, an emphasis on Jesus Christ and this, these offices that he uh, carries as a, our mediator. And our theology of the glory of God needs to consider that. And then 1 John through 3 John, we see that fellowship with the Father is through the Son and it's the outworking of glory in the Christian. And then Noel pre uh, taught last week about the revelation of Jesus Christ and how God's glory was revealed in Jesus' message to the seven churches He's the glory of the one who was pierced and God's glory was re revealed in God's judgment of the unbelieving world. God's glory is revealed in the events surrounding Jesus' return and it's revealed in the eternal state with the new Jerusalem. So that's a, a review. And whenever you're doing a systematic theology, to whatever degree and extent you've had the time to go through the Bible and look at what the Bible teaches on this matter, whatever it is that you happen to be studying, it's good before you begin to try to summarize things or relate things to one another to look at the, the forest now because you've been looking at all these individual trees. Now you need to take a step back. So let's go to the second point, but before... I, I get into that. Are there any questions at this point or anything anybody wants to add or thoughts that they were thinking about as I was sharing that? It's humbling when you see how much revelation there is around the glory of God. Um, God's glory is in every aspect of systematic theology. Whatever topic you choose, whether it be eschatology the incarnation, the church, creation, it's in every area. When we consider redemptive history, uh, we see God's glory 
working itself out in redemptive history. When we consider the person of God, we see God's glory referencing specific attributes. We see God's glory being the name of God, the majestic glory. We see God getting the word glory, describing his whole, his whole summary of his attributes. Um, and we see God's glory revealing itself, outworking and manifesting itself, and God saving and performing supernatural sovereign works that are called his glory. Then we see his people reciprocating, and it's called glorifying God. So when we start to think about glory of God, and we consider all these various ways of theology, and looking at theology, we realize the glory of God is, is everywhere. And it's not an easy uh, responsibility. Josh. It's okay. Um, yeah, I was just, um, as we were going through this summary, uh, just thinking about uh, various scriptures. So uh, to kind of um, uh, piggyback on, sorry, just had to use that phrase. Um, piggyback <laughs> what um, Pastor Mike was saying about, um, about the word and how God reveals himself and makes manifest himself, his glory known. Um, so Gospel of John, um, you know, just thinking about a couple of passages, like in John chapter 1, talking about how he beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and full of truth, and how you mention um, uh, the Trinitarian aspect. Uh, you know, there's various passages in, in John that talk about the relationship between the Father and the Son, but also, um, you know, the Holy Spirit. And you have uh, chapters uh, 14, 15, and 16, and how, um, you know, the relationship between the Father and Son is brought out even more so in his high priestly prayer in uh, chapter 17 of, of John. And then all the various signs and how, um, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, those signs were, were done so that we can believe that he is the son and have eternal life. Um, I think that's in chapter 20 or 21 towards the end. And then also, I'm not going to go through all of these, <laughs> but just thinking about Paul's epistles and how uh, Paul, there's that theme of the old man and the new man. Mm. And how, uh, you know, we, we are to, we're born to this world as the, the first Adam, um, but we're uh, brought in newness of life to look like the resurrected, the, the last and perfect Adam, or the second Adam. I forget the exact language of, of Paul, but also um, the glory uh, so you have Second uh, uh, Corinthians chapter three, um, how he beheld his the glory and how he moved from one glory to the next. Second um, Corinthians chapter three into um, chapter four, um, but also Paul brings up uh, the end, the eschaton, how uh, this whole creation cries out in glory in Romans chapter eight. Um, and, and then you also mentioned uh, his, uh, Christ and how Paul um, talks about the different states of humiliation and exaltation. And that made me think of Philippians chapter 2, where you see Christ humbling and then uh, being exalted. So just wanted to share my thoughts. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, and it, it's good to also continue to tie our, our thoughts, even if we trust they're accurate, continue to tie them back to Scripture. Yes. I just wanted to say one thing. I was really encouraged through our study um, 
to see, or, or really to not see, that gold dust falling from the ceiling or people rolling around on the ground is a manifestation of the glory of God. So if any of you are ever tempted to think that there's a possibility, those things that you see on, on YouTube, just remember, we went through the Bible and we <laughs> thought about the glory of God extensively and um, there is nothing of gold dust falling from the ceiling or people rolling around on the ground as a manifestation of the glory of God. Yeah. I w there, there's a, a, a little bit of a history there too with Luther and he had what was called the theology of the cross and he spoke against those who had a theology of glory. And what I'm saying when I say the theology of glory, it can be confusing when you hear that. But there were people who thought God could be known and communed with through his supernatural works and they emphasized uh, and they philosophized about God and sought to, to uh, come to know him through his, uh, his works and through his uh, general revelation. And it, was, uh, it sounded when I was reading it very rational, um, whereas it wasn't gospel-centered. And Luther would speak against that and say Christianity is not a theology of uh, merely doctrine or academia. And it's not uh, something that is obtained by experience. Like, um, if, like Pastor Michael was saying, do we have a supernatural experience when we're born again? Yes. So please don't get me wrong there. But there's a difference in those who have this idea of how God is known and communed with when they consider not the heart change by the Spirit, but other works of God, whether in history or ones they believe to be current. Whereas he would say the theology of the cross is where you come to know God and would focus on Jesus Christ in that way. Um, so if you ever hear that, the theology of glory being spoken against in some book, you know, it's not what we've been focusing on and it's a, a misuse of communion with God, obedience to God and how we come to know God. But uh, you made me think of it when you were, when he was talking about it. So let's go to the next point. And... It's developing a summary definition of multiple biblical meanings of God's glory. So as we were looking at the biblical theology and all these instances of this word glory and this, this uh, concept of God's glory uh, in the ways that we did look, we, we recognize we've got different senses here, different meanings, different contexts and now we can line up all those meanings and ask the question, is there a way to summarize this either in a statement or in a definition that would uh, be able to bring those things together so that we might be able to uh, think about them as a whole? And <clears throat> if you will remember before we get to that definition that the primary biblical vocabulary that we, u that we utilized to develop our biblical theology was uh, kebod and doxa, and we've gone over those meanings. If you will remember too, they were used as adjectives, as nouns, and as verbs. An adjective is like, um, you know, what color coat is this? It's a blue coat. That's an adjective modifying the noun of coat. So when we said the glorious God, it's, a, it's an adjective describing God. So the, those words were used in a way that would modify or inform us, describe something about God. And then they were used as nouns, the glory of God itself as, as a, its own entity in some sense. And then glorify God is a verb. So we looked at that in the use of kibod and doxa. And uh, 
we remember those general meanings, you know, kebod as weightiness, heaviness, uh, speaking to the abundance and majesty and splendor of God. And doxa has some various nuances we saw. It's really hard, though. I've even grown a little bit more with my understanding of dictionaries. Like, dictionaries, they're trying to give you what they see predominant meanings are in the Bible. But the ultimate ruler for a meaning of a word in the Bible is the context. So when you start looking at some words like, I will come in my Father's glory, that's very rich. We're talking about him being the eternal son of God. We're talking about him coming as a mediator. We're talking about him coming in works to judge and to save in power so we might go to the dictionary and say which one which one it's a combination and what tells us it's a combination it's the context and we compare that context and we understand it to other uh, revelations of the glory of God so anyways I'm giving you those dictionary definitions you know um, doxa carried some in the bdag which is a Greek dictionary of the meaning of the condition of being bright or another definition, a state of being magnificent, greatness and splendor, honor and a transcendent being deserving of honor. So in considering and remembering that vocabulary, we want to remind ourselves again of the usage of those words and coming up with a definition. And then what we did is we went through the Bible to look at the usage of those words And we came up with some various meanings of the words in our biblical theology. And I don't don't presume to say this list is exhaustive. But let's look at multiple meanings that uh, we saw in there before we try to come up with a, a system. Go to 2 Peter. One seventeen, and I'm going to uh, read these uh, in fairly quickly. For he received from God, or yeah, that's one seventeen. Second Peter one seventeen. For he received from God, the Father, honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. So here we see the word glory. If you remember, it carries the sense of a designation of God. It's actually describing or designating himself as glory from the majestic glory. We heard a voice which came uh, from the excellent glory. We, a voice came from, to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son. We know that's the father. Uh, if you go to the next, another sense, uh, turn to Psalm 24. And even if we didn't look at these specific texts as we went along, these senses, I believe, were captured in our teaching. And these verses are just to remind us of those and to try to isolate them so that we can relate them. And in verse 7, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. So that He is the king of what? Of glory. And that is a description uh, of an internal characteristic of him or an attribute or a summary of his attributes. I would say it's a summary there. Uh, But we see that word glory getting used to reference something internal about God, his nature. And then you remember uh, Stephen in Acts 7, he calls him the God of glory who came to Abraham. 
And now let's go to Exodus 16, 7. And I'll I'll read it six from starting from the quote. At evening, you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord. For he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? Also, Moses said, this shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening. And then if you'll skip to verse 10. Now it came to pass as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared, appeared in the cloud. So the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud is a manifestation of his presence. So when we're speaking here, we're talking about God dwelling in some sense among his people. If you look at um, Exodus 33 verse 14 and he said my presence will go with you and I will give you rest then he said to him if your presence does not go with us do not bring us up from here and then if if you look at 18 and he said please show me your glory And he says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. So he wants to see, he knows God uh, is going to uh, go, his presence will go with him and he wants to see the glory of God. So we can see here that um, in some sense, uh, when he's making his goodness pass before him, there's a presence of God there. And he declares and proclaims the name of the Lord to him. And we also see that the glory is a referent to the attributes of God here. So it has this, this here, this sense of God dwelling and also uh, a revelation that his glory is a summary of his attributes. And in John two eleven. We see the display of God's attributes, perfections, or persons, or person. Um, the, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So, glory, if you remember, takes on this sense of displaying something of God particularly here uh, with turning water into wine, his sovereign power over creation. And the ultimate goal, so we see, this is interesting, go to John 11, verse four. Another sense or meaning is John eleven four with Lazarus. When Jesus heard that, he said, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. What's the purpose, the goal? It's that the son may be glorified through it. So uh, we need to consider and weave into our understanding of a summary definition of the glory of God that not only does it, is it a, a, a referent to his nature and a summary of his attributes and a referent to his dwelling and these other things and his very name, but it's also a referent to his purposes. So we need to have an understanding of God's glory that, that terminates in him, so to speak. And I'll just read the others and then read that definition and we'll pick up with how we came to that definition like next time. So also, we, we didn't get to look at it, but heaven itself is called glory and consummated, and it's the consummated experience of God's presence. 
And also the appropriate response to God in the form of worship and obedience is to glorify him. And we can look at that too, how people are praising God or glorifying God when he does things. So this was, a, I think, the best summary that I've been able to find thus far, so I put it in here. The triune God, who is glorious, displays his glory. So it begins with who he is internally, and it, it moves from there to a display of it. And the display of it is largely through his creation, and his image bearers, his providence, and his redemptive acts. And as he displays and manifests his glory, his people respond by glorifying him. And then God receives that glory and through uniting his people to Christ, shares his glory with them. And all of this to his glory. So we'll see how those various reviews and and those senses were brought together to come up with that definition next time and then we'll go into uh, the the next point from there. We have two more lessons. Any questions? All right. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I praise you. We praise you for this sufficient word and, and even the, the blessing of living in this age and being able to hold the completed canon and um, have a, a clear view of Christ by the Spirit. I pray that our theology of your glory will continue to grow and we would be humbled to see our inability to Um, comprehend the incomprehensible and cling to what you have revealed help us to sit to bring it together as is fitting and appropriate and not go into areas where we ought not Uh, lord help us to trust you and not be like philosophers without faith but to be like children who diligently study your word and faith amen